It doesn't matter whether you're beginner or advanced, nearly everyone makes these mistakes, including my dumbass. Mistakes that'll slow your progress and lead to years of pointless, wasted practice. I'll show you how these mistakes tick, why you make them, and most importantly, how to fix them so you can get back to becoming the next Insert famous bassist you find inspiring. Check this out. Here's me trying to play some Bach. See if you can spot what I'm doing wrong. So what am I doing wrong? I'm making mistake number one, which is practicing too fast. Meaning going faster than you can play something like 90% mistake free. Making mistakes is a normal part of learning, but repeating the same mistakes over and over without trying to fix them will kill your progress. When you practice, you're firing off all sorts of circuits in your brain, muscles, and nervous system. If you practice too fast and repeat your mistakes over and over, you'll hardwire them into those circuits. Talent expert Daniel Coyle says the best way to build a good circuit is to fire it, attend to mistakes, then fire it again over and over. I see this mistake of practicing too fast most commonly in beginners who are often in such a rush to play a song they're excited about that they end up compromising technique, rhythm, and general non-suckage just to get to the finish line. But this is a problem for more advanced players as well. We've all seen that person, maybe jamming too loudly at a music store, who's playing some super advanced impressive riff but still sounding super sketchy because they never refined their technique. I'm definitely guilty of this sometimes too. Impatience waits for no man. Here's that Bach botching from earlier slowed down. Hear how messy my playing is? The solution? Use this four-step swap speed strategy. Because slow equals smooth and smooth equals fast, no matter your level. Although I guess that applies mostly to humans and not sloths, because this is smooth, but it's still really slow. Step one, throw the metronome out the window, or just pause it. Step two, play insanely slow, like slower than you think is slow enough, not worrying about rhythm at all. Just watching your hands, keeping your movements as efficient as you can. And if you're questioning your fingering choices, watch on because I'll cover that later. Step two is crucial because this is where you tell your fingers exactly what you want them to do, minus all the sloppiness you were drilling into them when going too fast. And when you make mistakes, you attend to them, like Daniel Coyle says. Then you fire the circuit again with the mistake eliminated. Step three, once you have it smooth at slop speed, you can bring the metronome back in the house and start playing it in rhythm very, very slowly. This is where people screw up and start playing too fast again, so don't be that person. Finally, step four, gradually increase your speed two or three BPM at a time. You might make a few of these jumps in one practice session, or it might take you multiple sessions to make one jump. Just make sure you're staying at least 90% solid so you can actually notice and correct the mistakes that come up. Until finally, you've wired this baseline cleanly into your circuits and you can actually slay it at full tempo. Junk food is tasty, but if you fill up on it, you suffer the consequences. There's a base equivalent of eating junk food for dinner. Do it and you get stagnation, stuckness, and snail pace improvements, which is super frustrating and can lead you to get bored and even give up eventually. So what is the base equivalent of eating ice cream for dinner? It's mistake number two, starting your practice with noodling. Noodling is repetitive, unfocused playing of the same old stuff you always play without any particular aim or attention to detail. Confession, like you, I also noodle. When I pick up the bass, I am overcome by the insatiable urge to do random slapping that doesn't really challenge me. I don't think it hurts my playing, but it's definitely not helping me get to the next level. Noodling isn't always a bad thing, and I'll explain how noodles can actually help you learn in a minute. But if you noodle excessively, your practice routine becomes empty calories. So why do we tend to noodle too much? Tackling challenging practice material is challenging. And us humans don't really like challenges that much. They're really uncomfortable. <laughs> so it feels easier to just play the familiar. The problem is then you don't progress past the challenge and get to enjoy playing better. The solution to excess noodles? Structure your practice routine. Doesn't sound very exciting or sexy, but it's the difference between plodding along at the same level and actually making big gains week to week. If you don't do this, it's like you're saying, I wanna get healthier, but then you keep eating ice cream for dinner. Dang, ice cream. 
So here are three steps to eat your base broccoli properly. One, establish your current top priority goals, whether it's learn slap, learn a certain song, increase your speed, whatever. Two, make a simple step-by-step -step plan to help get you there. One that you can chip away at each day and make solid incremental progress. And step three, structure your practice routine, serious practice first, and noodles last. This ensures that you make time for the important stuff, even if it seems less fun at first. But then you finish your routine with some fun noodles on the riffs you enjoy, which biases your brain to get more excited about your next practice. And it also makes sure that you save the beginning of your practice when you have the most energy and focus in your tank for the tough stuff. Because if progress is the name of the game, then you gotta get your base broccoli in. Oh. You've been practicing and practicing. Finally, you're on stage for your first gig ever. You look at the drummer, she counts off the song, and you completely forget how your bass line starts. To not have this happen, you need your bass lines super well baked into your brain. And there's a mistake that almost every bass student makes that slows this process by at least 50%. See if you can spot it. Did you catch that? Let's run that again. Here's the first time using one fingering. Here's the second time, same bass line, but different fingering. Yep, mistake number three is not planning your fretting fingering. You might have watched those clips and thought, I don't see a mistake, both of those fingerings look fine. How dare you, Josh? And you're right, neither fingering itself is a problem, and I'm sorry. But by not sticking to one fingering, you send mixed signals to your brain. Instead of memorizing one thing, a bass line played with a specific fingering, you're sending two different signals to your brain. Do it this way, oh, and also do it this way. So you're only practicing the fingering you'll actually use at the gig half the time, which increases your risk of a fatal train wreck. And that's the best case scenario. The worst case is there are a bunch of different fingerings in the mix, meaning your brain only sends the right signal to your fingers a fraction of your practice time. It also reinforces the bad habit of deciding which finger to use on the fly, which slows you down and makes you scramble. Basically, you'll sound like crap because you're in panic mode or you're using fingerings that make things like way harder than they need to be. This is a pretty universal issue for beginners, but even people who've been playing for years sometimes don't have a good fingering system. And I'll cover more advanced fixes in a minute. I got lucky and didn't struggle with this mistake much myself. I'd like to say it's because I'm some kind of extraterrestrial bass prodigy, but the reality is my upright bass teacher drilled this into me early on and I applied it myself to electric bass. The most important takeaway is to be consistent with your fingering choice. Even if it's not the best fingering ever, if it gets you where you need to be in time and you practice it consistently, it'll serve you just fine on gig day. But it also helps to use a really good fingering. So what makes a fingering good? Well, here are two symptoms of a bad fingering. Let's take the chorus riff from Muse's Hysteria, and here's a really bad fingering. <laughs> That's really hard to play. Uh, okay, so symptom number one is jumping the finger from string to string from sequential notes, like I'm doing with the index finger here. So I could fix that just by doing a bar in this case. So that's one thing. And symptom number two is unnecessary stretching, which often comes from not using the pinky enough. Because here, I only need to reach to the fifth fret, so I might as well use the pinky. Now my hand is more relaxed and naturally compressed. So that would give me this. And now my hand is a lot more relaxed, causing less strain, and I sound less crappy. Avoiding these pitfalls will help, but there's still a lot of options when you're choosing a fingering, and it can be a bit overwhelming. A teacher can be extremely helpful for this early on, but if you don't have a teacher or a foolproof step-by-step play-along-based beginner's course, then here's a couple ways you can dial in a fingering on a new song. One, if you can find covers on YouTube, or even better, a video of the original artist playing it live, watch those videos and take notes on fingering. Or two, if you can't find a visual reference, do a practice session where you go super slow, slow and just test out a few different fingering options until you find the one that feels the most efficient to you and then stick with it. Once you find your favorite with either method, the most important thing is to stick to it consistently to fully program it into your circuits. The more you let yourself slip up and change fingerings randomly, the longer it'll take to master the song because you'll keep slipping into panic mode. And the more you'll risk that brutal moment of the audience glaring at you expectantly while you fumble around trying to find your fingering. Whew, okay, got through that whole section without making any fingering jokes. What's next? Why is this guy 
able to do things that this guy can't. He doesn't understand the rules of the Matrix, so he can't unlock his superpowers. But at this moment, suddenly he sees the pattern of the reality he's experiencing, and therefore can kick major ass. So what does this have to do with bass? There's a way for you to wake up like Neo did, to see the Matrix of music, to recognize patterns that unlock your superpowers by avoiding mistake number four, which is not knowing basic music theory. I know, I know, even just hearing the phrase music theory probably makes you wanna go crawl in a hole and die. Like how you felt when you saw the fourth Matrix movie. But imagine you need to learn three songs for a gig this weekend, and the band leader sends you some chord charts that look something like this. Not only would music theory help you understand what notes to play when you see these mysterious chord symbols, but you could also see the deeper pattern in the chords based on the key of the song and realize that they're all actually the same pattern, which speeds up your learning and memorizing a ton. He's beginning to believe. Also, check this out. Here's a bunch of soul bass riffs. If you don't know any theory, you might vaguely hear these as being similar. But if you have the power to analyze how the notes fit against the chord, you can see why they all sound similar, even though they're in different keys. And then you can easily come up with bass fills in the same style by using a similar pattern. Now, I know what you're thinking, but so-and-so, the legendary bassist, doesn't know any theory, and he is the GOAT, so WTF, man, I don't need any theory. Some people, like so-and-so, the legendary bassist, are able to compensate with really amazing ears. But for most mere mortals, myself included, not knowing any theory at all will significantly slow you down even if you're an advanced player with tons of technical chops under your belt. If you don't know why a baseline does what it does, it'll be harder to remember because you can't recognize the patterns. That means it takes longer to learn new riffs and to memorize song forms. Not to mention, it's tough to communicate with other musicians if you can't speak theory. Once you memorize your key signatures, it's easier to keep track of your downtown and corporate graduation. Right. Here's the good news. Some basic theory, which you can learn in less than a month, will take you a long way. To me, the absolute minimum would be these three things. One, knowing major and minor scales and arpeggios. Two, knowing basic rhythm theory and naming for whole, half, quarter, eighth, and sixteenth notes. And three, understanding diatonic chord progressions. There are tons of free resources online to learn all that stuff. There's a bit of a learning curve, but it's not as bad as getting shot in the chest, which admittedly is a low bar. And if you're a more advanced player, I'd add three more things. Learning the modes, which is a bit of a beast of a theory chunk, but it's really important even for simple groovy music like funk and blues. Learning seventh chords and arpeggios, which gives you a lot more flavors and colors than just triads. And learning some more complex chord progression theory, so you can apply pattern recognition to a wider range of songs. A few years back, I had a student, let's call him Bartholomew, because that was totally his name. Bartholomew came to me wanting to learn this challenging Jamiroquai bass line. But Bart didn't have a good feel for 16th notes, which this song is full of. Even though he understood the idea of 16th notes, he wasn't able to consistently tell the difference in practice between rhythms like this, one E and, and this, one E and up. Rhythms that might sound similar to the untrained ear, but actually feel quite different. So when he made mistakes with the rhythm, he wasn't able to notice and correct them without my help. And this is mistake number five, trying to learn Jamiroquai songs. Okay, just kidding. Mistake number five, trying to learn songs that are too hard. This is almost as bad as only playing songs that are in your comfort zone. Cause if you go too hard, too soon, beyond where you can actually correct your mistakes, you'll risk learning bad habits and messy technique, or even worse, getting discouraged and giving up. Similar to mistake number one of practicing too fast, you're playing in a way where it's almost impossible not to make mistakes, then you end up repeating those mistakes and turn your technique to shit in the process. So unassisted, Bartholomew would play the bass line something like this.
But if you're sharp, you notice that what he played didn't match what was written. It was actually this. So how did I help Bart stop making this mistake? We put Jamiroquai on the back burner and worked some basic rhythm exercises until he was actually able to tell when he was making mistakes, which is the first step to fixing them. Eureka! So how do you avoid this mistake? Four steps. Step one, subscribe to Bass Buzz for bass lessons that aren't too hard. Bart couldn't do this because Bass Buzz wasn't a thing yet, so he gets a pass but you have no excuse. Step two, if you don't already have one, develop a solid base of at least 10 to 20 songs that you can play cleanly. These should be pretty easy and not take more than a week or so to learn each. This is super important to make sure you have a foundation of knowing that you can learn songs and have fun playing them. Otherwise, you're gonna be brittle and super easily discouraged when challenges come up, which they inevitably will. Here's a few fun, easy songs you can get under your belt if you're new-ish. Seven Nation Army. Sunshine of your love is a cool riff. Or Super Freak is all so cool. I made a bigger list of 20 easy songs down in the description for you. Then you know you're capable and you can come back to these songs later for reassurance. So aim for like fun and inspiration, not challenge. And you will learn something from every song you learn, even if it seems easy. Step three, then pick a song that's just a bit more challenging. So how do you do that? By choosing a song that you predict might take two to three weeks to master. So you can start developing the meta skill of overcoming challenges without getting overwhelmed. If it's two weeks later and you're not making any meaningful progress, then you probably picked something that's too hard. So just put that one away for later and pick something easier. Finally, step four, you take off the training wheels and you keep building that challenge level, keeping in mind the guideline from mistake number one to keep playing 90% decent so that you can actually track and fix mistakes. Picking songs at the right challenge level is challenging as a beginner. Having a good teacher who knows your strengths and weaknesses is super helpful. And I've tried to solve that problem for students in a less expensive and more reliable way with the songs and play alongs in my Beginner to Badass course. If you need some inspiration for songs to challenge you at your current level, then check out 10 songs that taught me bass from easy to 